Hi guys and welcome to the final lecture for chapter 8 as well as the final lecture for module 2. Now in the beginning of chapter 8 we introduced the topic of biodiversity by introducing uh, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. We then discussed some of the benefits of biodiversity as well as some of the consequences of losing biodiversity and some of the leading causes of biodiversity loss. Now for the final lecture in chapter 8 we're going to go over a relatively new field in biodiversity biology, something called conservation biology, which attempts to conserve biodiversity around the entire globe. So conservation biology is a scientific discipline devoted to understanding the factors, forces, and processes that influence the loss of global biodiversity around the entire globe. In doing so, conservation biology aims to protect, restore, and more accurately just conserve what global biodiversity we actually have left. Now, conservation biology was created actually in response to some of these widespread species extinctions, this sixth mass extinction event that humans have caused and that we have seen around the entire globe. And in doing so, it aims to develop solutions to, to problems such as habitat degradation and habitat loss, two of the things that are the leading cause of biodiversity loss around the entire world. Now, unlike most branches of science and scientific disciplines, conservation biology is science with a goal and a specific aim. Typically, branches of science want to understand the natural world around us to just increase our understanding of the natural world, education and knowledge for the sake of education and knowledge, conservation biology is a little bit different. It has specific goals and aims, those being to understand the causes of biodiversity loss and figure out ways to remedy or reduce these uh, causes of biodiversity loss so that we don't see these continued precipitous declines in species diversity around the entire world. So while most branches of science simply want to understand everything, conservation biology wants to understand the natural world around us for the explicit aim of preserving what biodiversity we actually have left. And so the major goal and uh, drive of conservation biology is to respond to the species losses that we are seeing around the entire globe. And to do so, conservation biology integrates an understanding of evolution and ecology in order to understand the impacts of human beings on organisms around the world. And this works at all levels, from the genetic and organismal ecology perspective, all the way up to the species and then ecosystem and even biodiversity perspectives. So this is a very holistic understanding of the world around us with the explicit aim of promoting and preserving biodiversity. Now within the context of conservation biology, conservation efforts typically focus on species which need the most help. And this can refer to threatened species, endangered species, or something called a critically endangered species, something that I'll get into in just a minute here. For now, I want you to become aware of two specific definitions. The first is probably one that you've heard about before and that is an endangered species. An endangered species is a species whose population numbers are so low that they are severely threatened with extinction. There are very few individuals of the species left in the wild, so few that they could become extinct at any given time. This is the type of species that we typically focus our priorities on. Then we have something called a threatened species. A threatened species is a species whose numbers are still kind of large, but those numbers are swiftly dropping and approaching numbers that could soon be threatened with extinction. So you can think of a threatened species as a species with populations that are not quite as bad as those of endangered species, but they're still pretty low and low enough to actually be concerning. But this isn't so black and white that we have species which are threatened and endangered and species that are not. There's actually quite a wide range of distinctions that are given to a species based on how large its numbers are in the wild. And this is carefully monitored by something called the IUCN Red List. And that IUCN stands for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And this is a red list that documents and monitors species which have a very high risk of extinction. And the IUCN Red List rates a species based on its population from least concern all the way up to extinct in the wild and extinct. And we're going to take a minute to go over each one of these definitions. You don't necessarily need to be aware of the explicit definition for each one of these categories, but you definitely should keep in mind which ones are worse than others. So keep the order in mind in terms of severity, but you might not necessarily need to know every explicit definition here. First you have your least concern, and that's going to be the distinct 
distinction over here in the green at the bottom of the right hand side of your screen. Least concern means that these species have populations which are pretty high and they are doing pretty well, so the IUCN is not really concerned with monitoring them at this time. Then you have near threatened. Near threatened means that while the numbers of these species are still pretty good, they have been dropping in the recent past and so they are being carefully monitored to make sure that their populations are still doing well in the future. Then you have your extinction risk category and that's going to be the colors in the box outlined in red. These are going to be your species that are threatened with extinction. The first is going to be your vulnerable species and that is basically analogous to the threatened species that we talked about in the previous slide. So again, while the populations of these species are still fairly high, they are dropping and dropping swiftly. So swiftly in fact that they may soon be threatened with extinction if action is not taken. Then we have endangered and again endangered we already defined. These are going to be species with populations that are so low that they are very threatened with extinction. Finally we have an extra term in that extinction risk threatened category and that's going to be your critically endangered species. That's going to be in the box in red. Critically endangered species means that there are very very few. We're talking maybe tens of uh, individuals left in the wild. They are so threatened with extinction that even one disturbance event in their area could completely wipe them out. Finally, we get to our extinction categories, and these are going to be delineated in terms of extinct in the wild and just extinct, period. Extinct in the wild means that there are absolutely no individuals of the species left in any wild ecosystem on the planet. The only place where these organisms of this species can be found are in captivity, so zoos or research institutes that are specifically there to to promote their abundances and reintroduce them back in the wild. While extinct in the wild doesn't mean that we can't reintroduce these organisms back into the wild, so there is hope for a positive ending to the story, it does mean that their abundances are extremely low. So low, in fact, that researchers have made the decision to pull all of the individuals of the species left that were in the wild into captive breeding programs in order to bolster their numbers up so they don't go outright extinct. We also should note that when an organism is extinct in the wild, it means that there are no individuals left in any wild ecosystem, meaning that the niche that that species would would normally fill in an ecosystem is completely unoccupied, so it is essentially absent from its role in any native ecosystem. Finally, we have our extinction box, and this is going to refer to when the number of individuals of a species completely reaches zero. When this happens, there's nothing left we can do. From any of the other distinctions in the IUC and Red List, we can rebuild the individual populations of any one of the species in any of these previous boxes. However, when the number of individuals of a species reaches zero, there's nothing left that we can do, and that species is gone forever. Ever. Now, as reported in 2012, around 20% of the 64,000 species monitored by the IUCN Red List were threatened with extinction. That is a terrifying number and it reflects the sixth mass extinction event that we talked about in the previous lecture. Now, there are a number of laws in both the United States and internationally that attempt to protect biodiversity around the world and some of these species that are under threat of extinction, and we're going to spend a minute talking about a few of them, particularly as they pertain to the United States. The first is something called the Endangered Species Act, and this was enacted in 1973. This is the primary legislation within the United States that protects biodiversity and protects species which are threatened with extinction, and it is intended to prevent extinctions of endangered and threatened species within the context of the United States. And in addition, it is aimed at trying to get these populations to recover, so bringing up the number of individuals in the populations of these threatened and endangered species within the United States so that their numbers are not so concerning. Now, the Endangered Species Act is particularly powerful due to the fact that it protects the habitat of any endangered or threatened species, not just the species themselves. And this is is really powerful because, as we have noted, habitat loss is the number one driver of biodiversity loss around the entire planet.
planet, meaning that if you protect the habitat of an endangered species or a threatened species, you tend to really increase the chances that you're going to be successful in promoting their numbers. And in addition, by protecting a habitat of an endangered species or threatened species, you increase the likelihood that you are also protecting other threatened or endangered species that we might not just know about. Remember that we don't know all the species out there, so it's impossible to monitor everything. And by protecting a habitat of one endangered species, you increase the likelihood that another endangered species that we might not know about that lives in that habitat can also be protected as well. Now, in addition to protecting habitat, the Endangered Species Act also prohibits the trade of any living endangered species and any products made from dead endangered species, and this is aimed at reducing over-harvesting and the illegal pet trade, both of which also severely impact biodiversity loss around the entire planet. Now, moving a little bit broader, we have several international treaties which promote conservation, and the most popular or well-known is going to be CITES. CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, and basically what it does is it encourages countries to ban trade of endangered species or threatened species as well as their body parts. So it protects endangered species by banning the transport of any products that are made from them. And their big win came in the 1990s when they got the entire world to ban the ivory trade, which significantly reduced over-harvesting of wild elephants, in particular wild elephants in Africa. And so by reducing products explicitly made from endangered organisms, they prevent over-harvesting of endangered species around the entire globe. Now, for the remainder of the lecture, we're going to be talking about methods to restore endangered species or threatened species once their numbers have gotten too low. So now that we've seen that their numbers or populations are really small, the question becomes, how can we bring those numbers up? How can we return those populations of those species back to numbers which are safe or in the least concerned category? And the first way that we can do that is through captive breeding. Captive breeding is a process of maintaining plants and animals in very controlled environments like Activity, such as wildlife reserves, zoos, and other controlled conservation facilities with the intention of releasing bred animals back into the wild. So we are conserving a few of those animals in captivity, and then we are breeding those animals and releasing the offspring into the wild to bring up the numbers of those populations of those species in wild ecosystems. Now this is used to increase wild populations, particularly of endangered or threatened species, but it is now increasingly employed, unfortunately, to bolster the numbers of critically endangered species or species that are completely extinct in the wild. A great case in point is the California condor. And so the California condor is basically an enormous vulture and it is actually one of the largest birds in the world and the largest bird in North America. And while there were very large populations of this bird historically in its native range of the southwestern United States, they, their populations began to precipitously decline as they were killed off from sport in the mid to late uh, 19 hundreds as well as dying of lead poisoning because they were scavenging carcasses that were killed with lead buckshot. As a result what this led to was in 1982 there were only 22 birds left in the entire wild so this was a population that if left unchecked would have almost certainly become extinct. So in 1987 researchers made the heart-wrenching decision to pull all of the birds that were left in the wild into captivity and begin a captive breeding program and that has been a tremendous success as they have bred populations of this species of this bird over and over again over many many years we now have over 170 birds in the wild so they've gradually been reintroduced into Arizona and parts of Southern California where they're beginning to retake their native range so this is one of the success stories of captive breeding as well as a method of restoring species as we mentioned just because a species is extinct in the wild doesn't mean there isn't at least some hope for that species. In the case of the California condor, while they are still very much endangered, they are doing better and better and better, and because of captive breeding programs, their numbers continue to increase every single year. 
Another method to restore and promote species diversity around the world is through the preservation of biodiversity hotspots. Biodiversity hotspots are a region or regions that support especially great numbers of species found nowhere else in the world. Those are going to be your endemic species. And these areas tend to be insanely biologically productive and very, very biologically diverse, hence the term biodiversity hotspot. Now, what happens is that researchers figured out a long time ago that it wasn't going to be feasible to save every single habitat on the planet. They didn't have the time, the money, the resources, and populations are constantly growing. So we're constantly developing new habitat and converting it into places for people to live. What they realized then was that if they couldn't save every habitat on the planet, they needed a way of prioritizing some habitats more than others to conserve the most valuable habitats. So they delineated habitats based on those having extremely high biodiversity and prioritized them above every other habitat. By conserving biodiversity hotspots, they are trying to preserve as many endemic species as possible and prevent as many species as possible from going extinct. So this is another way that we can aim to restore or just conserve biodiversity around the planet by, again, keeping certain habitats, which are very biologically productive, away from being bulldozed and lost. And so conservation of biodiversity hotspots is a great way to maintain or conserve biodiversity simply because it is a way to keep the most valuable habitats on the planet from being lost to human development. Now, parks and protected areas are another method of restoring species diversity or preserving biodiversity around the planet. Now, this entails preserving natural lands in the form of parks or protected areas, which can aid in protecting a species from extinction. And again, this goes back to preserving the habitat as a way of preserving the species. If you don't have a habitat for a species to live in, odds are its populations probably aren't going to do well. Right now, around 12 to 15 percent of the world's land are now in parks and preserves and this offers a degree of protection for endemic species because again by preserving that habitat you keep it from being degraded or lost due to human development however there is a caveat here species can still be threatened and exploited via over harvesting if parks and preserves are not properly managed and this is a prolific problem in africa where they have a lot of species that are subjected to over harvesting and poaching and they have a really really tough time fighting off all of these poachers and keeping these species numbers in check so while parks and protected areas are a good measure in terms of preserving habitat, they are not enough if habitat loss isn't the only thing that is driving a species numbers down. Now the final method of restoration of species diversity and preservation of global biodiversity comes through ecological restoration. And this refers to the action of restoring damaged or degraded ecosystems back to a semblance of their former form and function. And recall back to that Everglades restoration example that I talked about way back in chapter four. Now, in restoring damaged ecosystems, we can bring back species that had been extirpated from that area and allow those species to reestablish themselves and restore ecosystem functions and services that we actually rely on. So by returning some of these species back to their former niches, they can actually rebuild the uh, ecosystem in a way that is actually not unlike succession and reestablish that ecosystem to be more biologically productive, promoting of species not uh, in terms of populations and promoting the ecosystem services which they once uh, served. An example of an ecosystem that has been restored is going to be at the, the figure at the bottom of your screen over here, where on the left hand side you can see the before of an ecosystem which had been completely degraded and then the results after an ecosystem had actually been restored. You can see that it went from being completely bulldozed and developed to something that looked far more like a natural uh, aquatic ecosystem, maybe something like a pond or a lake. Now that is everything I have for you guys for uh, chapter 8 and module 2. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, biodiversity, uh, the biodiversity chapter and conservation biology within the context of chapter 8 and I hope you guys enjoyed uh, module 2 as well. Now remember if you haven't done so already to register for your exam on register blast. Remember if you don't do so within a week I really can't help you. To register a week in advance ensures that you have a slot for that exam so please do so immediately if you haven't already done so. If you have any questions about chapter 6, 7, or 8, or you have any questions on your study guide or quiz questions, or in your Think Deeper modules, please let me know and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. All right, I will see you guys again next time for module 3 and the beginning of chapter 9 when we go into forest ecosystems. I'll see you guys then.